suboptimal, but it's the best we could do uh, without delaying even further. So take it away. Thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciate uh, Hope in uh, inviting us to uh, talk with you. And again, I, I apologize for the primitive display uh, option uh, that we're left with. But if you can um, just uh, deal with that, uh, let's begin. Okay, this is my partner in crime, Peter Leung. He uh, runs uh, the CryptoMail.org uh, organizational aspect of it. I'm more or less the technical lead. Okay, it's Saturday morning, 9 a.m., and look at all the technical difficulties we have. Did you guys sleep? I didn't. Uh, thanks for being here, okay, because uh, it takes a, an extended effort uh, to get up this early. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk about some of the problems that CryptoMail tries to solve, some of our missions and objectives. We're gonna, we can't go through a program demonstration, unfortunately, because things are just uh, simply AFU. Um, we can go through some of the algorithms and protocols that we use. And we can go over some of the client and server platforms we are using. And we can go uh, and talk about the future directions. And we can go into question and answer after that. OK, thank you. Okay, why is, crypt why is encrypted email important? Well, it protects your privacy and your assets. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, I think it's kind of neat to be able to send uh, and receive confidential information. Uh, it's free speech. You have every right uh, to do so, to use uh, encryption in your communications with other people. And uh, so you should be able to speak your mind. Uh, and what we should do is we should try and make it as pervasive as possible and as out there as possible so that uh, it becomes uh, so entrenched that no one or nothing can take it away from us. OK, so how do we get people to use encrypted email? Uh, I call this the grandma problem. How do you get your grandma to communicate with you securely? Um, it's kind of hard. You know, the programs that are out there, are, you know, they're, they require, you know, a high level of, uh, of geekdom in order to get them up and running securely, too. So that's one of the main problems that CryptoMail tries to address is just how do we make it easy? Uh, also, you want your the solution to be migratory. You don't want to be. You don't want to have to carry your keys uh, on a USB dongle. You want to or a floppy. You want to just be able to go anywhere, sit down at a at a terminal, and just log in and use your public and private keys. We want a zero in uh, install client. That means that uh, no special software has to be installed. No non-standard software, rather. So you go to Kinko's, and uh, you know they have the registry on lockdown. They do all these kind of things in order to prevent you from uh, nefariously installing software, which is a good thing. Uh, but with a web browser, you should be able to log in and use encrypted email. We want the platform to be open. We want it to be open source. We don't. Uh, we want to be, you know, have a ubiquitous uh, user experience. When you use the program, it should look like mail. It shouldn't look like an XML editor. Uh, we want the transparency. Open source gives you that. When you disclose the source at the client and the server, uh, it becomes uh, no question as to what the program is doing. Okay. What here? This is uh, tying into some of the problems that we're trying to solve. What's the threat model? Okay, we're always going to assume Eve is around. She's always listening to our traffic. Okay, that's just a given. And we're also going to assume that Mallory is kind of there. Mallory has your system or can get your system. So the threat model says 
or tries to address can we build a system such that the user's private keys and messages are not immediately compromised with a zero install client? And can the transport be locked down such that Eve only hears basically line noise or encryption? Okay, so again, our mission is to promote the private communications and Again, the technical objective is to answer the threat model questions. So we want security at the transport layer and end-to-end -end message in, uh, encryption, and we don't want to disclose any private key information to any agent other than the user themselves. Okay, so the demonstration is kind of borked. But if you guys want, you can go to www.cryptomail.org to have a full demonstration of this functionality. Okay, what are we doing here? What is the uh, technology and encryption platform that we're using? We're using Elgamal 1024, and uh, I have a note here that says RSA is good, but at the time when I was writing this in uh, 99, early 2000, RSA was still encumbered, so I couldn't use it. Although technically I could have started using it and then all of a sudden the patent expires and then um, everything would be hunky-dory. But things as, the, as they were, I released it as is with Elgamal. GPG uses Elgamal as well as a default uh, ASIM. The symmetric cipher. For symmetric ciphers we use Blowfish. It's a great unencumbered public domain cipher. Really strong, 128-bit good stuff. The protocols. We have secure XML message access protocol, SexMap, and XMAP. XMAP is something like IMAP, but in XML. I didn't, uh, when I was writing this, I didn't, I didn't want to incorporate IMAP because um, I thought it was a pain. Okay, so the protocols can all be found on our website at cryptomail.org, and you can go through the documentation and look through the protocol specifications. But what this talk is going to be mostly about is trying to show how we lock down the user's private keys and secure the session. So how we can prevent Mallory from gaining any salient information about your private keys and how we lock down the transport session. Now, CryptoMail, as it stands, is a Java applet, okay? And at the time, there was no SSL capabilities embedded in the VMs. So you couldn't do HTTPS without uh, incorporating, incorporating your own vertically independent libraries. And so that could get kind of big, it can get kind of floppy because I'm not going to sit there and write you know, my own uh, SSL layer. I'm going to use someone else's because that's pretty good practice. But at the time, uh, I've, I was thinking of a way to try and avoid having to use SSL entirely. So the next uh, couple of minutes will be focused on how we use normal HTTP with a applet that is served uh, via HTTPS, how we're gonna lock down the session. So okay, when you first start out in CryptoMail, you're presented with a login form and you just type in your username and that gets submitted through HTTPS. So Assume that uh, you, you submit that securely and you post it via HTTPS. Then the server generates a 16-byte session key. That's just your session uh, that, um, I'm sorry, it, it generates a 16-byte session encryption key. Okay, this is used to encrypt the session between the client and the server. Then the server generates a 16-byte session token. Okay, this is the session client server identifier. Then the server generates a 16-byte session cloak token. Okay, this is going to be a little challenge. 
and the server generates a 16-byte random blowfish cloak key. Okay, that's used to encrypt the challenge and put in HTTP headers. Okay, so the server passes the client, uh, passes the applet, all those things. It passes the session token, which represents the applet session with the server. It passes the encryption key, okay, how the client and server are going to encrypt the, the, um, the traffic uh, with 128 Blowfish. It passes the cloak token, which is basically this, to this, this token challenge and a session uh, cloak encryption key. Now the applet reads up the parameters and in theory because the, the, the form was submitted securely, in theory the only one who knows about this parameterization is the client and the server. Okay, so whenever the applet wants to communicate with the server, okay, the applet Blowfish encrypts the session cloak token with the cloak token key. This effectively authenticates the client at the HTTP layer. So it's a quick acid test to verify that only the single client and the server uh, are talking. So the applet constructs all this information and sticks it in the header. It encrypts, it, it encrypts the Blowfish encrypted session token and the server looks up the token and if it can't find it, it's an error. And the server compares the cloak tokens and if they're the same, if they're not the same, then abort. Okay, so again, why do all this? Why tunnel? Why effectively try and do HTTPS over HTTP? Again, it's because there weren't any SSL faculties at the time to communicate uh, with, within the Java VM and the server. Also, when, uh, if there are libraries, you have to, uh, you have to um, make the, uh, the server and client uh, use authenticated certificates. So, so I didn't have any money at the time. Okay, are there any questions about the SSI, Secure Session Initialization? Yes, sir. Okay, well, the applet is parameterized through SSL. Yes, there's, um, well, okay. My assumption was is that uh, no one could uh, could do that because the what should I call it? Because um, if the I don't know. I guess if there's a man in the mill on SSL through HTTPS, then you know it is what it is, right? I mean, if you could uh, like I mean, if just with any uh, SSL communications, if someone gets in the middle and someone gets in the middle, right? Um, yeah, on, on, on SSL, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> assume that the client, after the client posts through HTTPS, the form and the server passes back the applet and the parameterization that that information is confidential. Okay, we'll have to assume that. Everyone does. Uh, you know, uh, we were probably wrong. Someone out there knows how to do it. Probably. Yes. Any other questions regarding SSI? Yes, sir. Okay, they last, right now they last uh, 30 minutes. Yes.
Okay, if if uh, if she closes the, uh, you're saying uh, if she closes the navigator window. Okay, if she closes the window, it'll send the app, the applet will be sent a message. Uh, uh, I think it's a, basically an on destroy meme. Okay, and on destroy it automatically logs you out. Whether that's conformant Java uh, VM behavior across all platforms is, your, is as good a guess as anyone's. <laughs> but we'll have to assume that uh, all relatively new VMs are compliant. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, you. What, excuse me? Oh, okay, it's in the Java VM. So when the Java VM goes poof, um, basically, if the Java VM cleans up uh, its memory, then everything should be fine. I'm sorry, I, I will have to defer all responsibility, uh, you, know, uh, you know, for the behavior of, 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 of VMs. I, you know, that's, it's one of the toughest things. <laughs> Um, it's 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 really hard because all the software is laid on top of each other. So if the VM doesn't clean up after you close it, and you can go in there and take a peek at it, that's a distinct possibility. But yet, yeah, that's the reality we live with other uh, other systems. While in memory, no, um, it's it's all in the VM. Yes, that's a, that, that is a possibility, but I, I do not make that effort. We're going to assume that the uh, client machine that, uh, that grandma is using is uh, exactly not loaded with Spire. It's a really big assumption these days, okay? <laughs> and uh, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not a huge reality, but, you know, uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to assume that there's uh, nothing terribly malicious against, uh, against, against crypto mail, but it's entirely possible. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the threat model. Let's get back to the threat model. You know, the SSI, okay, so we've got, you know, we, we've tunneled HTTPS. We did all this work just to freaking, you know, get away from paying certs and incorporating this huge 256K vertically independent SSL library that's going to be really slow because it's written in Java. <laughs> okay, generally, you know, you know, software crypto with Java, I mean, that's like two strikes against you already, okay? It's bad enough, you know, just doing software crypto. You're gonna really burn some cycles. Okay. Okay, the threat model. Um, basically, let's talk about Mallory, okay? What, at the end of this, we should show that Mallory, while well, he may pinch me, okay? is going to have a little bit of hard time. You know, with today's hardware, the current implementation in terms of size, I'll be uh, a little bit uh, direct with you. The current implementation in terms of key size is um, on a particular user uh, focus is not terribly strong, but neither are passphrases in general. So if you do, if you read the passphrase back, it says basically passphrases are, you know, it, they're basically useless because the domain, the search domain is um, for, you know, basically today's hardware is, is, uh, is pretty small. In any event, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try and go over the thread model and show you that Mallory might have a little bit of a difficult time. So creating an account. Basically the applet creates uh, a public and private key pair and the user chooses a passphrase and the applet CBC Blowfish encrypts the private key with the passphrase. So you have your, the entirety of your passphrase encrypted with the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you have the private key encrypted with the entirety of the passphrase. Then the applet saves half the hash of the passphrase. Okay, so you've got your encrypted private key and you've got half the hash of the passphrase. Now the applet basically constructs a little Mac 
at the end of the encrypted private key blob, uh, blob just to make sure, you know, for later use to authenticate that um, the private key information hasn't changed. So we got half the hash of the passphrase, the encrypted private key encrypted with the entirety of the passphrase, and we've got the little Mac. Now the applet sends the message, new account with the public key, the encrypted private key, that's encrypted with the entirety of the passphrase, half the hash of the passphrase, and the encrypted hash of the passphrase. So basically it goes through SSI before it, it sends that, and it just sends the new account. And then, uh, does anyone remember the web lore from Maher? That, uh, what was it, a Turkish guy or something, I don't know. He was like, uh, he wrote, he wrote this cheesy GeoCities uh, web page and it said, I kiss you. You don't remember that? Welcome to my site, I kiss you. Okay, well this was uh, around that time and I was uh, making this protocol, so this is an ode to him. It, was, it, made the, it made Wired and all this other stuff. Okay, so, so what do we have on the server? We've got the encrypted private key, encrypted with the entirety of the passphrase, We've got the public key. Okay, everyone can have uh, each other's public keys without any problem, right? I'll assume that. Um, and we've got the, the Mac of the private key. Now, what happens when you try to log in? Okay, so the client wants its private key information, right? It wants to send and receive end-to-end -end encrypted messages. So, basically what happens is the applet requests a passphrase, then the applet SHA-1s and saves half of those bits, okay, and then it logs in with half the hash of the passphrase. So basically, you know, we set up all the HTTP, uh, HTTP headers for SSI, Secure Session Initialization, and the applet sends the, the payload. Then the server compares half the hash of the passphrase. And if it's, if it's successful, it sends the encrypted private key and the encrypted hash of the private key. So half the hash of the, of the passphrase is stored, uh, encrypted again, basically as a password. Okay. So then the applet uh, basically decrypts the private key and, it, and then it authenticates the Mac. And if the decrypted hash don't match up, doesn't match up, then it splits bill. So at this point, what does the server know? The server knows at most half the hash of your passphrase. Okay. So the server maintains a high level of security of the user's identity without compromising the private key. Okay, so going back to the threat model, Mallory who may control the server only knows half the hash of the passphrase, not its entirety. Okay, any questions about that? Yes, sir. It's, I think it's the first half. Yes, yes, absolutely. See, that, was a, that, was, that would be a concern if it took a random number of, 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 of bytes the first time or, you know, or the second time, then someone uh, listening passively could determine the entirety, you know, could get the whole hash of, the, of, of it. And so that's, that's certainly not good. Uh, you don't want to disclose uh, any more information than you have to. No, the serve all encryption and decryption is done on a signed Java applet. Okay, Let, let's talk about let's talk about this. Mallory has gotten your machine. Okay, what does he know? He's borked your server and he has got he's got half the hash of your passphrase, and that's it. What can he do? Can he change the signed applet? Can he change the behavior of the signed applet?
it's basically the SSL problem, right? I mean, you've got this encrypted, uh, you've got this, uh, you've got this applet that's signed by a trusted root authority, which crypto mail is not. Okay, but let's just assume, <laughs> let's assume that you know these are not poison certs, okay, and that these are good certs, okay. And I bought my VeriSign certificate, and they verified me through Dun and Bradstreet, and I signed it, okay. Could someone change my? Uh, could change, someone replace my binary and still have it come up with uh, the correct uh, information? And I don't think so because I keep the private key for encrypting or signing the applet offline. Those keys aren't even there. So Mallory's going to have a really, really hard time changing the behavior of my applet. But he can certainly get the session. OK? Game's up. He's got my session. But if you're sending encrypted email, in theory, the bits of the end-to-end -end encrypted messages should be fine. He can know what folder you're browsing. Uh, he could see all your XMAP traffic. But if the contents of the message are encrypted through end-to-end -end message encryption, provided the applet is not poisoned, and I purport that it probably won't be because it's supposed to be signed, and so he can't change it, that uh, that the message contents going end to end are going to be relatively uh, locked down. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, it's a long story. It really is. It's a long story. You can go to www.cryptomail.org. Um, unfortunately, um, that we're viewing it under under this thing. There's no. There's no network, and uh, it's absolutely indefensible. And I'm perfectly sorry for that. But if you go to www.cryptomail.org, you can see the applet running. If you're not scared of my poison certs, <laughs> because I haven't paid. So I, I, I deeply apologize for that. OK. Yes, sir, in the back. That that's um, that that is an attack. Yes, yes. That um, if you want to send it, uh, CryptoMail allows uh, basically provides for escalated uh, privileges, so you can send attachments. So Grandma wants to send a recipe, and it's in this uh, text file. She can do so, uh, but the applet needs escalated uh, privileges. In the event that Mallory replaces that with unnecessarily sign code, then yes, we have, uh, we have been poisoned, indeed. OK. Uh, OK, so XMAP, XML Message Access Protocol, you know, it's just, a, it's just a, my silly substitute for IMAP. Um, it's nice XML. You know, James Clark writ a great XML parser, XPAT. It is so, it's like butter to develop with it, OK? Uh, if you want to do any kind of protocol development with XML, XPAT's the way to go. So you guys can take a look at that. So basically, we're going to talk about the client platform. It's, you know, it's a Java applet. It uses HTTP POST. Um, the current implementation works in Mac OS 9. Um, it's got a nice ubiquitous interface. For the back end, we use MySQL 323. Uh, what's of note here is that uh, basically there's no system user names. There's no system users. They're not in, uh, in Etsy password or anything like that. Everything is inside the database. So the file system and everything else and the user base is all inside uh, the MySQL tables. It uses any uh, Unix-based web server that does out-of-proxy GI. Um, the session encrypt encryption engine employs the GPG cipher uh, portion, and it uses SendMail as the MTA. OK, and here's a little picture of the schema. Yeah, we're waiting. OK, 
Where are we going? Should we use open PGP as the base? I don't know. Sounds like a good idea. I think uh, we can get a lot more people to use it if we did that. Um, should we make or use an instant messaging client along with this? So when you log into the crypto mail server, use your public and private key to encrypt in instant messages to each other through this mechanism. So grandma can communicate with you live as opposed to emails. How can we link servers? And how do we trust uh, public keys? These are outstanding questions that CryptoMail has yet to address. So what I'd like you to do uh, in, in, in the face of my belly flop with the uh, autonomous uh, demonstration, I'd like you to visit CryptoMail.org and uh, just take a look at A, the code, and B, the code running. Uh, I can go over uh, it with anyone who wants to. And basically, uh, we need help. <laughs> we need uh, developers and HTML UI people who are interested in, uh, in implementing pervasive cryptography. And we're going to go to questions. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't know, really. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> I, the reason why I chose El Gamal is simply because it was unencumbered. Okay. Yeah, at the time I was writing it, uh, basically RSA was, uh, had a patent out on it at the exact time I was writing it. Now, had I waited three months before deployment, sure. Uh, I could have used RSA without any kind of encumberment whatsoever because the patent expired. But if we look at what other people are doing, um, GPG uses Elgamal as a default, so I would say, you know, it's pretty good. It's good stuff. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, that was one of the areas of e exploration that CryptoMail has yet to, uh, you know, uh, go through. But in theory, if CryptoMail used PGP as the mechanism for message encryption and end-to-end -end encryption, then I guess we could use PGP keys. Yes? Uh-huh. Well, okay. Um, I, I I don't I don't know necessarily the exact program you're talking about. I I, I guess I'm I'm assuming Blowfish is a is a uh, encryption. Yeah, it's a it's an encryption tool. Encryption tool. Okay. So yes, um, you would have to assume either the encryption tools were congruent or the protocols that they speak are congruent. Um, if they're not, uh, you're certainly going to have. Uh, problems. Now, PGP is a specification, so if you encrypt things uh, to the same specification, in theory, uh, one uh, should be able to communicate with each other. But PGP is generally very good at it. If you use PGP, another PGP program will probably be able to encrypt and decrypt. Yeah, you can get uh, PGP from a number of sources. Um, if you're using uh, Unix or a Unis, rather, uh, GPG works extremely well, and that's at GNU Privacy Guard, uh, GNUPG.org, GNUPG.org. Yes, sir. Yes.
You know, I really haven't tried it. Um, maybe I can get some data points. I would like to try it. Uh, that that's a very interesting, interesting question. But yeah, adding anonymity to the picture is certainly uh, something of value. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Key revocations. Um, basically, I don't. Right now, CryptoMail.org does not, uh, in its current uh, format, does not support that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Okay, the, 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 the message, it works almost like PGP, uh, it's, but it's not, okay? The message is encrypted uh, with a symmetric cipher, but the symmetric cipher key is encrypted with Elgamal. So it works kind of like PGP. I mean, uh, it, it would be very uh, foolish of me to uh, encrypt the whole message with uh, a symmetric cipher. So we use a symmetric cipher for the message contents, the message key, we use asymmetric encryption. Um, I have thought about it, yes. Um, and it just so happens that most of the VMs actually do support uh, uh, compression. Yes. Yeah, but in working towards my goal towards a more standard message format, I think that um, that might be taken care of in some other way. Yeah, I I mean, if I were to go to open PGP, then yeah, that's I think that's part of what 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 the uh, what the PGP uh, guys do is they usually compress first, depending upon message size. I mean, it depends on your implementation. I've seen some that uh, don't compress, but I've seen some that compress based on um, the size of the message. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry that um, I didn't get to give you a demo and it was kind of floppy, so thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.